Hello, everyone. I'm Rose Gottemuller, and I wanted to welcome you today to this conversation on a restart for US-Russian nuclear arms control. It's my great pleasure and honor to be hosting this event today, and I look forward to your comments and questions during our discussion period. We will begin with a short presentation uh, by the authors of this new Carnegie uh, report, and uh, I'll begin by introducing them. And it's also my great pleasure that uh, we are joined today by Alexei Arbatov uh, from Moscow. Uh, Alexei and I uh, worked together uh, while I was director of the Carnegie Moscow Center on several research projects, and it's really a pleasure to have him with us today from Moscow. So wherever you are, either good evening, good morning, or good day, but it's wonderful to have you with us for this event. So first we will begin with a short presentation of this new Carnegie report. And uh, the two presenters are the two authors. First, James Acton, who holds the Jessica T. Matthews Chair and is co-director of the Nuclear Policy Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. James is a physicist by training and his current research focuses on the escalation risks of advanced conventional weapons and the future of arms control. I have known his work for many years. He is one of the wisest heads on issues such as dual capable missile systems. And I know if you've been working in the field, you've taken great advantage of his research and writings over the years. Pranay Vadi is a fellow in the nuclear policy program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. His current research focus is focused on developing future US nuclear posture and arms control proposals, and also Congress's role in arms control policy. Pranay is here by training, and I uh, really benefited from his expertise, his lawyerly as well as his substantive expertise, uh, while I was uh, the Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security. Uh, so I do uh, commend the work that he's doing now uh, in the think tank world. And Alexei Arbatov is the director of the Center for International Security at the Primakov National Research Institute of World Econ Economy and International Relations of the Russian Academy of Sciences. He's a full member of the Russian Academy of Sciences. He has been uh, in and out of the Russian government. He participated in the START One negotiations in 1990 and was deputy chair of the Defense Committee of the State Duma from 1994 to 2003. And when I with him, he was heading the nonproliferation program at the Carnegie Moscow Center, which was from the period 2004 to 2017. So indeed, it is again a great pleasure to uh, have all three of you on uh, our call this morning. Uh, it's morning for me here in California. And I'm going to turn first to James and uh, to Pranay to give us some, uh, some hints about what the report is about, to lay out some of the main points, and then we'll turn to Alexei for his comments. Please, James. Thanks, Rose. And uh, just to kind of start by saying thank you to both you and to uh, Alexei. Uh, I can't think of two more uh, knowledgeable and experienced arms controllers to take part in this conversation this morning. The United States and the Soviet Union, now Russia, have had a strategic arms control agreement in place, uh, regulating their nuclear forces for most of the time since 1972. Um, and that has brought uh, generically kind of two different uh, uh, forms of uh, stability. Uh, firstly, it has helped uh, limit and eventually roll back arms racing. Um, and secondly, it's promoted crisis stability. Uh, which is to say it's enhanced each side's confidence that its own nuclear forces are survivable, uh, which in turn has reduced the danger of nuclear use. So the current arms control treaty, uh, New START, which Rose negotiated, uh, is due to expire in February next year. Uh, it can be extended for up to five years, and both Pranay and I strongly support an extension for five years. Um, but actually, regardless of whether or not it's extended, there is the question about what should replace it. Uh, and that is what Pranay and I have been thinking about in the new report, which you can uh, freely download, uh, seeks to kind of uh, include our recommendations of key provisions for a new start follow on treaty. Partly the value we see in this treaty is 
uh, uh, continuing the enduring value of arms control uh, in terms of crisis and arms race stability. Um, at a time when both the United States and Russia are building up there uh, uh, or developing new forms of non-strategic nuclear weapons, we already see an incipient arms race underway, which if there is no strategic arms control treaty in place could spill into the strategic space. Um, but at the same time, we, view, we think there are also specific problems that arms control can solve. From a US perspective, Russia is unrolling uh, so-called exotic strategic capabilities. These include a new hypersonic loose glide missile, Avangard, uh, which has already been deployed and, and is new start accountable, I should emphasize, though future similar weapons may not necessarily be, be accountable under arms control. Russia's working on a nuclear powered cruise missile, Burevetsnik, uh, a nuclear armed torpedo, Poseidon. Um, and so one, one challenge is, 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 is for arms control is to manage these capabilities, which don't or don't necessarily fit into a new start framework. A second one is Russia has expressed various concerns about the way that the US has converted. Uh, that is removed from accountability by rendering them incapable of um, delivering nuclear weapons, uh, various launchers. And that's a problem that Russia has continuously raised and that we think the uh, we, we think the next treaty should address. Uh, and then finally, uh, Russia is concerned about the survivability of its nuclear forces. Uh, and at least part of that stems from fears of counterforce attacks, that is US attacks on Russia's nuclear forces, preemptive attacks, whether with nuclear or non-nuclear weapons. Uh, and you know, we also attempt to mitigate these concerns, particularly of US conventional counterforce attacks uh, against Russia's nuclear forces. Um, I should say that in, you know, in crafting the ideas, the elements of this treaty, um, we're trying as best we can to come out with a fair and uh, a mutually beneficial arrangement that will hopefully uh, aid each side, uh, the United States and Russia. Um, we're not attempting here to put forward you know, a US negotiating position or anything like that. But it's important to recognize that there are some things that we don't think this follow on treaty should do based on what I've described. You know, this is, and Pranay is gonna plunge into some of the details here, but this is a treaty on, new, on strategic offensive arms. Uh, we don't try and deal with China in this treaty, uh, which the Trump administration has indicated it wants to do. We don't try and deal with non-strategic nuclear weapons in this treaty, which the Trump administration has indicated it wants to do. And we don't try and deal with ballistic missile defense uh, which is a key Russian area of concern. Uh, we think if you try to shoehorn too much in negotiations, uh, you risk the collapse of negotiations. Uh, and that collapse of negotiations could lead to uh, the, the, the end of any form of arms control. Now that's not to say that we, ballistic missile defense, non-strategic nuclear weapons, China are unimportant. On the contrary, Pranay and I are working out, working, uh, finishing a, a second publication right now in which we aim to pr propose practical, pragmatic ways uh, of dealing with these with our colleague T.D. McDonald. Um, but, you know, we, we think that uh, these kind of negotiations have to be anchored in what's possible. And for our mind, that strategic offensive arms control uh, that aims to enhance arms race and crisis stability, uh, while, you know, dealing with these problems of the moment of Russia's exotic strategic systems, conversions and counterforce, uh, attacks. Uh, and now to kind of just give you some examples of the way that we try and deal with this, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Pranay. Thank you, James. And um, thank you, Rose and Alexi, for participating and um, for everybody who's tuning in right now. I know it's uh, difficult times to spend time in the middle of the day um, here on the East Coast um, listening to us talk about arms control, but we do appreciate your attention on this um, really important subject area. As James mentioned, you know, we are trying to find um, practical proposals that both sides can possibly agree to in the strategic offensive armament space. And I think from our perspective, enough has changed in the strategic offensive armament space since New START entered into force. It warrants another crack at a bilateral strategic arms control agreement to say nothing for the other types of arms control agreements that the United States and Russia may wish to conclude in addition to this. Um, three areas I wanna to touch on. One, um, with the advancement of strategic offensive armaments, there are new kinds of weapons 
that the US and Russia should consider bringing into an arms control framework. And I will touch on a couple of those. Um, in particular, the, the potential for um, intercontinental range ground launched boost glide missiles um, or hypersonic boost glide systems with ranges beyond 5,500 kilometers um, is one area. Um, the United States, for example, has um, attempted to test and um, continue to develop since the 2010-2011 timeframe ground launch boost glide systems that could have over 5,500 kilometer range. Um, for example, the Army Advanced Hypersonic Weapons Program, um, which was first tested in 2011, was designed to exceed 6,000 kilometers. Um, it's unclear exactly the state of that program now, but clearly there was interest on the US side in developing this type of technology under the conventional prompt strike program. Um, and the US position during the negotiation of New START was that conventional non-nuclear boost glide systems that didn't otherwise meet the definitions of New START that is to say, they didn't use an ICBM or a submarine launch ballistic missile, an SLBM as the carrying vehicle, should not be considered accountable under New START. So if that's true, that means in a future agreement, if these types of systems were to be constrained, we would need to define them specifically as a new kind of weapon that is uh, distinct from an ICBM or an SLBM. So our proposal is to do just that. Another system that we, we think is worth constraining in this treaty is uh, nuclear torpedoes. Um, I believe um, various terms have been used to describe the Poseidon, um, a, a developmental weapon that um, Russia is developing and was publicized in 2018, which more or less is a multi-megaton nuclear warhead on an undersea autonomous delivery system with intercontinental range um, that would be launched by some sort of carrier submarine. We think the system is pretty similar in um, how ballistic missile submarines and SLBMs would be controlled under New START, um, but it's obviously distinct since it utilizes an undersea nuclear delivery system to ultimately carry a warhead to a target. So we think, again, this is a type of weapon that should count under numerical limits in a future agreement, as would any other strategic nuclear delivery system, such as an ICBM or an SLBM. So for both the intercontinental um, ground launched boost glide missile and nuclear torpedoes, we propose adding these types of weapons by definition to the numerical limits of a new agreement. So either country can deploy these types of weapons, but they would have to deploy them under some kind of numerical ceiling, which means they may need to reduce the number of more traditional strategic nuclear weapons that they would deploy. Another topic, as James mentioned, um, you know, we think in the wrap up of a new start, whether that is in 2021 or 2026 or somewhere in between, um, in transitioning into a new treaty, one issue that will have to be dealt with is um, how the United States converted its four submarine launch ballistic missile launchers on each of its Ohio class ballistic missile submarines to remove the nuclear um, ballistic missile launch capability. Implementation issues at the end of treaties um, left unresolved will get wrapped up in future agreements. So we're proposing to head this off and um, deal with the conversions issue as part of this new agreement. So New START allowed significant flexibility in how parties can carry out this conversion procedure. Uh, you know, from the US perspective, it used the flexibility in the treaty to convert these systems according to the letter of the treaty. From the Russian perspective, the procedures that the United States used without getting into technical details, um, the inspection procedures don't allow Russian inspectors to confirm that the US has done what it says it has done, which is remove the capability to launch a Trident II SLBM from one of these converted launchers. So we think we should use what has worked in the past. Our approach would uh, mandate that the United States um, use conversion procedures, um, reconverting these submarines in effect, that will physically narrow the launch, the launcher's diameter so that a Trident submarine launch ballistic missile launcher can no longer fit physically inside the launcher. Russia has accepted this procedure in the past. Uh, the United States during, in, during the START treaty implementation, um, looking ahead to when the START II treaty could enter into force, which it never did, uh, the United States converted four Ohio class submarines to be cruise missile submarines. So all of the SLBM launchers on those submarines were narrowed um, and converted such that they could carry Tomahawk cruise missiles. 
Russians have, in, have accepted those procedures because they involve the physical narrowing of the launchers. So we propose that the United States do the same thing for its four converted launchers per submarine now. And of course, the two sides could work out a timeline um, such that those conversions could take place while the new treaty enters into force and they'll conduct inspections and uh, associated transparency activities to confirm that those conversions have taken place. Um, I'll touch on the last topic um, that, George, that uh, James mentioned um, regarding enhanced transparency for a conventional counterforce. Um, the United States and Russia are both going to be deploying new dual capable bombers in the near future. Um, we think a flexible approach um, as neither Air Force has determined how exactly these things could fit into a treaty. How are um, bombers that are supposed to have conventional roles going to fit under numerical limits or should they? And how will nuclear capable bombers fit under limits? So given that this is uncertain, we propose that the two sides agree new dual capable bombers, um, which are designed for a conventional role, should be based at air bases, which do not have any nuclear infrastructure or nuclear weapons present. On the other hand, the nuclear capable bombers um, that are assigned to a nuclear role should be based at um, air bases that have nuclear infrastructure or you know, nuclear armaments present. That way the United, United States, when it deploys the B-21, for example, should assign B-21s to a conventional role to the Dias and Ellsworth Air Force bases, for example, whereas uh, B-21s that are designed for a nuclear deterrence role should be assigned to one of the three nuclear air bases, uh, Barksdale, Minot, or Whiteman, and a similar thing would take place on the Russian side. In terms of enhanced transparency, um, you know, one may wonder under this bomber assignment or segregation practice, isn't it easy to fool monitoring by switching conventional bombers to nuclear air bases and vice versa? So you're essentially hiding a, a breakout force of nuclear bombers by calling them all conventional and assigning them to a different bomber base. So we think that we should have enhanced transparency for all new dual capable bombers, as well as um, older conventional B-52s. The objectives here are to help monitor what is a pretty flexible approach um, by using bomber assignment, as we proposed, but also have greater confidence in uh, conventional bomber operations, because as James suggests, as the munitions improve, precision strike capabilities improve, um, Russia may have fears that the U.S. can conduct these surprise counterforce missions using only conventional weapons. And so um, that leads to some nuclear escalation concerns we think can be mitigated through enhanced transparency on conventional bombers. And the types of transparency measures we're talking about are more or less applying new start notification requirements to certain conventional bombers. So assigning unique identifier numbers, uh, notifications through the Nuclear Risk Reduction Center, anytime a conventional new bomber is going to move or participate in a major uh, strategic exercise. Um, these are all uh, procedures that have worked well under New Star, and given the U.S. and Russia an indication of the nuclear armed bomber forces of the other, and we think it can be applied to new conventional bombers as well. Uh, with that, I will stop and uh, hand things over to Rose and Alexei. Thank you very much, Pranay. I wanted to uh, remind the audience that if they have questions for us during the discussion period, you can ask your questions in the YouTube chat or you can tweet your question to at Carnegie NPP, no spaces, at Carnegie NPP. So Alexei, over to you for your remarks. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Rolf. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you and, and great honor. And um, I will uh, get immediately to the, to the subject um, to save time. Uh, I like this report. I read it several times and made a lot of notes. I think it's a, it's a good piece of work, a very, very well thought through, uh, very detailed, and I would say quite unbiased. It's, it, it's fair uh, with respect to both parties. Uh, I also agree with uh, most of their proposals on the substance of the next start and uh, on the adjacent issues like ballistic missile defense, tactical nuclear weapons, China space, that those are the issues which deserve separate negotiating for it and uh, should not overburden the basket of uh, the next start. Uh, but I disagree with some of their uh, proposals. Uh, first of all, I cannot agree uh, with their, uh, my friends, avoiding uh, talk about the new series. 
uh, saying that this is uh, mostly a political issue. Of course, it's political issue uh, and the political relations between our two countries uh, presently uh, are quite bad. Uh, but it's not only political, but a strategic issue. Depending on the counting rules and the scope of the new treaty, reducing the ceilings by one or 200 delivery vehicles and warheads may mean nothing with respect to strategic stability and the goal of uh, limiting the arms race. And depending on uh, other uh, scope of the treaty and different counting rules, reducing the ceiling by one or 200 delivery vehicles and warheads may imply comprehensive and very deep uh, strategic arms control treaty, which would address the issues of strategic stability and the most destabilizing trends of the present, which are uh, the entanglement of conventional and uh, nuclear weapons and uh, employment plans, uh, thanks to James Acton, that's his term, uh, and also the selective uh, nuclear war fighting plans and systems. Those two um, uh, developments are the main uh, factors of instability in the present strategic balance. And I think that as much as possible, those have to be addressed by the next treaty. Uh, you cannot prohibit all those systems and plans, but you can put them under uh, strategic treaty counting rules and limitations. And that way you would limit their destabilizing effect. Now talking about the details. Um, uh, my principal disagreement is, if I understood the report correctly, uh, that uh, James and Frenay uh, proposed to consider bomb, heavy bombers as counted under the uh, start, uh, next start limitations uh, as delivery vehicles, but do not address, address at all bomber weapons. They all allegedly, as far as I understood, should be counted as uh, one delivery vehicle and one warhead, regardless of how many weapons and of what kind are on the bombers. Uh, I think that uh, due to the uh, destabilizing trends related to new bomber weapons, both nuclear and conventional, uh, traditional cruise missiles, especially very long range cruise missiles, which are being developed, uh, air ballistic missiles, which are being developed, future uh, boost glide airborne weapons, they should be counted against warhead ceilings. They cannot be counted as one warhead, uh, even if uh, bombers which carry them uh, should be counted as uh, deployed heavy bombers. So I would suggest, first of all, to return to start one and two counting, rule and counting rules and to count bomber weapons um, against uh, the uh, overall warhead ceilings and to counter bombers against overall delivery vehicles uh, or launcher ceilings. The program of minimum for me would be to count nuclear cruise missiles and any future uh, nuclear bomber missile against those ceilings as individual warheads. The program maximum for me would be uh, to count not only those missiles, but also nuclear gravity bombs. They have never be been counted in start or sold or uh, sort or treaties. But they should. I do not see any reason why to exclude them, in particular when we are talking about penetrating stealth bombers, which are clearly a weapon of, not of deterrent but of nuclear war fighting. So th that would be my uh, program maximum. And my program super maximum would be to count those and conventional long range cruise missiles, 
uh, air ballistic missiles and boost light systems against overall warship ceilings. That would uh, affect not only the uh, uh, reductions of nuclear and conventional arms, that would affect uh, the uh, state of strategic stability very much. If we include all those systems which I propose, then uh, the ballistic missile warheads and warheads on other existing and future uh, non-bombard uh, sea-based and ground-based ground -based, uh, missiles would have to be very drastically reduced. Uh, even with the uh, overall reduction of ceilings and delivery vehicles on the start by one or 200, new counting rules would provide for 40 to 50% reduction of um, uh, other weapons. And they would certainly limit the new uh, weapons which are being introduced and the exotic weapons which are being discussed, in particular those which Russia is uh, developing and uh, plans to deploy. Uh, Besides, the internal logic of this uh, draft is not always immaculate. If you propose to count individually boost glide submarine launched nuclear missiles, why discount air launched nuclear cruise missiles? If, if you propose to count uh, uh, ground launched uh, intercontinental um, uh, boost glide systems, and cruise missiles and nuclear-powered torpedoes, regardless of their warhead, why discount uh, conventional missiles of the bombers? I think that the logic should be uh, more or less balanced uh, regarding those all those all those new weapon systems. Now, uh, with uh, uh, the um, uh, prohibition of certain uh, weapon systems. Uh, my friends proposed to prohibit uh, nuclear-powered intercontinental cruise missile, this uh, well-known Burivesnik. Uh, I do not have any particular sympathy towards the system. I do not think it has a serious strategic justification, and I, I do not think it's a cost-effective system. But prohibit, prohibiting it only because uh, it may be dangerous, because uh, in the United States, uh, they do not like it, or because it's, in, it's not environmentally friendly, will not be accepted by Russia. Just like proposal, they do not propose it, but there is proposal also to re revive prohibition on fractionally orbital bombardment system. Because if you remember Putin's presentation uh, two years ago, uh, he presented the new heavy missile as capable to attack from the southern azimuth. That means putting it to orbit, making it fractionally orbit this orbital system. In SALT 2 and START 1, such systems were openly prohibited. Um, so proposing to prohibit it Sarmat in this way would also not be accepted, just like prohibition on nuclear-powered tor torpedo. Those weapons are developed to counter American ballistic missile defenses, and that was clearly spelled by Putin. Uh, whether it's justified or not is a subject for expert discussion, but this is political position of Russian leadership. If Americans uh, uh, reject any proposal to discuss in any way limitation on ballistic missile defenses, then proposal to ban uh, the systems which I mentioned uh, will not be seen as fair and justified in Russia. But counting them would be quite a fair proposal and just justifiable. Counting uh, uh, those uh, ground-based intercontinental cruise missiles, uh, of course, counting uh, the uh, new uh, heavy missile, whether it's uh, fractionally uh, orbital or just normal ballistic missile, and counting the Burivesnik nuclear-powered torpedo under star ceilings, I think would be uh, reasonable, and there would be no reason to reject that if, their new, if, if the definition of the new systems is spelled out clearly from legal point of view and included into the next START treaty. And besides, including them into START treaty would probably lead to their either 
cancellation or development in very limited number. For instance, take this uh, Poseidon torpedo. Poseidon torpedo, uh, a huge weapon system. Uh, the, there are, the, the, the plan is to build four spe special submarines for such torpedoes, each carrying uh, eight torpedoes, so that makes 32 torpedoes, 32 warheads. If instead of those four submarines, Russia built four normal ballistic missile submarines with normal ballistic missiles, uh, it would have not 32 warheads, but uh, 384 warheads, 10 times more, which is much more cost effective and the, the system would be reliable, tested very well and uh, uh, being very stable in its effect on, uh, on strategic stability. That's just an example. I think that um, uh, putting that uh, in a proper context of strategic arms control would affect the prospect of their uh, deployment uh, very seriously. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. This has been a, a super rich discussion this morning. All three of our uh, speakers have put a lot of issues on the table. One thing that strikes me, I like very uh, ambitious uh, notion of, of counting warheads in the next treaty is the degree to which it will require very ambitious uh, monitoring and verification as well. And perhaps during our discussion period, you could remark on how you see uh, the negotiability of such, uh, such very intrusive monitoring and verification, because it's my experience in the past that the Russian Federation has not been particularly enthusiastic <laughs> about highly intrusive uh, verification measures at, particularly at warhead sites. But let's get into our discussion. And I invite, rather than uh, having another round of exchange at this point and, and coming back to comment, on Alexei's remarks, um, I'd really uh, like to open up to our discussion. We're already getting quite a few questions from the audience. I wanted to, uh, and believe me, you're welcome to hang any remarks you want to uh, on uh, your answers to questions as we go forward. So do feel free, all three speakers, to, uh, to come back and comment on what you have heard this morning. But I just wanted to remind uh, both you and the audience that uh, when Alexei and I were working together at the Carnegie Moscow Center, we published uh, a piece in Arms Control Today in uh, July of 2008 that was called New Presidents, New Agreements, Advancing U.S.-Russian Strategic Arms Control. In 2008, we were looking at the demise of the START Treaty and uh, worried about moving rapidly to replace it with uh, a new treaty, which became the New START Treaty. As I reread the article yesterday, there were many scarily similar aspects uh, to the, to the uh, period of time and what we needed to accomplish in a very short time. So um, I'm wondering how you compare the two periods. I'd like to start with that question and maybe uh, bear in mind uh, some uh, remarks about the, the current negotiations that are going on because we've had a question asking uh, about the very different assessments between Moscow and at the moment of the state of the current negotiations between Special Envoy Marshal Billingsley and uh, Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Rybkov. I noticed this morning Minister Lavrov has also been uh, has been commenting on the negotiations. So I wonder if you would uh, say a bit about then and now perhaps, but also comment a bit on the current negotiations and, and how you see them. So Alexei, uh, let me turn to you first and then we will move to our other two uh, speakers. Um, you're right, Rose. Uh, we've had a long history of working together on this subject and some of our proposals uh, were put into practice. In particular, thanks to you and Ambassador Antonov, uh, you negotiated the new start, and uh, I was very proud of that. Now, uh, with respect to verification, uh, I was trying to formulate my proposals so that verification would be easier. If you count uh, gravity bombs on bombers, nuclear cruise missiles, and conventional missiles, whether cruise missiles or boosted light as individual warheads, you will avoid the necessity to distinguish between nuclear armed and conventional or conventionally armed systems. The only bombers that would be left out of 
counting rules would be uh, bombers equipped for conventional bombs for conventional operations and bombers equipped for missiles shorter than 600 kilometers range. That is the long established uh, cutoff range for air launched weapons, exactly not only air launched, but sea launched as well, ever, even starting from SOLT 1 of 1972. And uh, also you can propose a lot of other range uh, criteria. I think that uh, they are as good as ever, no need to revise them. Uh, now, uh, with respect to uh, the uh, state of relations, certainly uh, there is a drastic difference between the present and uh, that time on the eve of the new start. And that, that makes things uh, very uh, complex. Um, but it's not only the bad state of relationship, which is my concern. My principal concern is the relatively low priority of arms control in relations between the two states. At that time, priority was considered very high uh, regardless of much better relations. Now priority is considered much lower regardless of the fact of very bad relations. And I consider that to be one of the major paradoxes of today. One would think that if relations are bad, you have to make arms control as the principal, one of the two or three principal routes to avoid nuclear war, the top priority. But we see that uh, the uh, extension of the new start and the uh, follow-on treaty are being just a pawn in domestic politics and international politics. And uh, that, for me, it's, it's a very frustrating reality. Thank you very much, Alexei. And you make that point very well in your current article in Survival. And so I wanted to uh, convey to the audience also that that is well worth reading and something that you just, uh, you just uh, published. So uh, thank, you. thank you for that. Pranay, what would you say about either the current diplomacy or uh, then and now? So I guess I'll start with the then and now. I mean, as I mentioned in my remarks, when uh, conventional prompt strike has sort of a uh, um, theoretical and has now become much more of a topic of when are these things going to be deployed, um, a lot of the weapons advancements that um, were being touched on, but kind of set aside, I think, in the very late 2000s, have uh, now become deployments. And so a new strategic arms control treaty should actually have to grapple with these things. I think the, um, in terms of the state of negotiations, um, you know, the two countries knew that New START extension was the preeminent question to deal with, um, beginning in 2017 when the Trump administration took office. The fact that we're seeing such an uptick of activity here just weeks before the election, to me demonstrates that the um, the question should have been addressed in some fashion long ago, so that the process today could be focused on what to do next. Um, part of the ideas that we've already put, put out there in the uh, restart proposal. Um, it's unfortunate that we're where we are, and now all this debate is still on this question of new start extension, which again should have been answered some time ago. Thank you, James. As it happens, I remember the article that you and Alexei wrote from 2008 very well. I've been, most of my, I, I kind of was a fairly recent addition to the nuclear policy field, and most of what I was working on at that point was non proliferation. And that was actually one of the first things I ever read about the strategic side of things. So it was actually kind of quite an important intellect article for my own intellectual development, as, as well as being an objectively important article. Um, I think Pranay's highlighted what I would flag as the main technological difference between now and then. Um, you know, we have developments in delivery systems, both nuclear and non-nuclear. Uh, and I think that a follow-on treaty has to take account of that. Uh, politically, this is also a different time. Um, primarily, I mean, or at least importantly from the perspective of US domestic politics. I mean, back in 2008, um, you know, President, then Senator Obama looked likely, at least immediately before the election, to win and to win big in the Senate. 
Um, plus there was a bit more bipartisanship on arms control. So one could imagine uh, a treaty being ratified with 67 votes, which indeed, you know, New START just exceeded that threshold. Uh, it's much harder to imagine today. And actually, I think this is one of the big political challenges within the US uh, is of getting a, um, um, uh, a, a, a treaty ratified in the Senate. I think, I think that's a huge political difference between now and then. Um, I think on the other hand, you know, I mean, certainly Vice President Biden has said, has, it, has, has, it, has you know, indicated a clear interest in doing arms control. I think this probably actually would be a priority for the Vice President if he, if he, if he wins the presidency. Um, one of the things that I'm interested in hearing from Alexei, and you know, I think we should go to take other questions, and uh, you know, Alexei can wrap this into his response. But is whether he th is 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 how he assesses that the Russian government would be interested, or, or whether the Russian government would be interested in counting in uh, uh, weapons, so individual weapons associated with bombers. I mean, Pranay and I, we, I don't know, sure, we went back and forth on this issue for months while we were writing this report. And ultimately, I guess it wasn't, we, you know, I think, I can only speak for myself, but I find Alexei's logic very persuasive. Our concern about including counting for individual bomber weapons was that actually neither government really wanted to do it and it would simply be a bridge too far. Uh, but I'm very interested in, in, in how, in, in Alexei's assessment of the Russian government's interest in this. But, you know, as I say, I, um, you know, also love to take some questions from the audience as well. Very good. And again, I invite us all to make this a conversation, weave things in as, uh, as we're uh, trading our views back and forth. We do have a range of questions here about how to bring others to the table, how to bring China to the table, how useful is it quickly to bring China to the table. And Bruce McDonald asks, how about the UK and France? How are they responding? Uh, to the U.S. position on the new negotiations. So I'd be interested in uh, your thoughts, your thinking about, uh, about that, uh, that phenomenon of bringing other uh, nuclear weapon states to the table. And James, let's go uh, in reverse order. We'll uh, hit you up first, please. So, I mean, Ambassador Billingsley has made clear that he's only interested in bringing China onto the table. So, you know, I suspect, I actually haven't spoken about this specific issue with UK and French officials. Um, you know, there hasn't exactly been much opportunity for informal discussions over the past six months or so. But, you know, my assumption is that the UK and France are perfectly happy with a three-way treaty, providing that they don't, you know, providing that they're not expected to contribute anything. Uh, personally, I don't view that position as being sustainable over the long term. I mean, you know, immediately the next treaty, I believe, should just be bilateral. Um, but I think that um, uh, it's important to engage all other third parties, including, you know, China, but as well as the UK and France. I mean, I've published a proposal. I think Alexei said very similar things before about the UK, France and China uh, on a voluntary basis, essentially adopting US and Russian uh, transparency arrangements associated with strategic arms control, uh, giving voluntary statements about how much about how many nuclear weapons they have, uh, the kind of information that the US and Russia exchange, um, the uh, UK, France and uh, China could exchange. Um, I think the only time I've ever been shouted at by a government official in 15 years of doing this was by a French official when I raised this idea with him. So uh, suffice to say that um, 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 there is, from my experience at least, there is, there, is, there is resistance in all third parties to being involved in this kind of process. Thank you. Let me go next to, to you, Alexei. Uh, I have a special question for Pranay, so I'll go next to Alexei about, uh, about other parties at the table and, and what you think about that. The question, uh, you're giving the floor to me? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I am not expressing official position uh, of the Russian government. It, it goes without saying. Moreover, I do not know what is the official position of Russian government. Uh, it's kept very close uh, to the chest, so to say, of both uh, negotiators, what they are discussing. Uh, but I think that Russian government would not be against uh, including uh, gravi nuclear gravity bombs in the warhead counting rules, if only because uh, Russian heavy bombers do not carry nuclear gravity bombs. They only carry nuclear and conventional missiles, uh, cruise missiles. Uh, as for 
uh, conventional and nuclear cruise missiles, uh, Russia is now uh, ready to deploy the new bomber uh, air, air launched cruise missile, which is dual purpose missile, H101 and H102, which is called 101 is convention, 101 is convention, 102 is nuclear. In order to avoid very intrusive verification procedures of distinguishing betwe between the workers of the two identical missiles, I think that uh, Ru Russian government might, might be uh, quite uh, um, uh, well disposed towards the idea of counting nuclear and conventional cruise missiles beyond 600 kilometers range against the uh, uh, against the overall war ceiling. But that's my logical proposition. And you know, the governments very seldom uh, build their position on strategic logic. Usually uh, there are some uh, different grounds about that. Interestingly enough, during many years, Russian government was insisting on including limitations of precision guided long range conventional weapons into any new start agreement. And the development of such weapons by the United States was one of the reasons why the Russian government rejected proposals of um, uh, President Obama administration to have a next treaty reducing the workers from 1,500 to 1,000. Recently, I have not heard of any serious attention being paid by the Russian government to limitation of conventional precision guided systems because Russia is intensively developing and deploying such weapons of its own, both on, on land and uh, at sea and uh, on, uh, on, on aircraft. So the, Ru the Ru Russian position changes and uh, provided that the uh, conditions for limitation are fair and equal to both sides, uh, Russian government may be re receptive to the ideas which, if proposed, it would reject out of hand because uh, it was not seriously discussed. Now, with transparency and uh, with uh, with uh, third nuclear weapon state, France, Britain, and China, I think that France and Britain will have no problem in accepting some of the transparency um, uh, provisions uh, and exchanging information. They do not have. They, don't, they are not making secret of their nuclear forces and their development plans. So th that would be not legally obliging to them, but they could uh, introduce their own uh, figures and data uh, for this, uh, as, a, as a gesture of goodwill for the sake of transparency. China is very different. China is very close. If it goes for, uh, forward uh, with transparency, it will be step by step and it, it will require some concessions of other sides, in particular the United States, for every small step of opening information of Chinese uh, nuclear weapon system. Thank you, Alexei. My views accord with that as well. I really think we need to be thinking about a step by step approach with China, but I'm by no means. Uh, lacking in confidence that we can, uh, we can get there. Given the experience I've had uh, over the years with the so-called P5 process, where slowly but surely China has taken a much more active role in the P5 process. So that gives me some confidence of step-by-step -step, um, progress here. Now I've asked uh, Pranay to put on his lawyerly hat because Tom Moore has asked a series of questions uh, about uh, extension of the New START Treaty. Uh, so, um, if the New START Treaty is extended for only one year, can a President Biden, if he's sworn in, extend it again uh, for longer? So, Pranay, what's, what's your comment about that? That's a, that's a great question. I think Tom is um, pointing at a really contemporary issue that, um, you know, if the U.S. position as it currently stands is only to secure a short-term extension, which I believe is what Ambassador Billingsley has said, um, then it's reasonable to assume that you know a future administration, whether it's the Biden administration or a second term of the Trump administration seeking to prolong a stable atmosphere for follow on negotiations may want to extend again. Um, so I'll start with what the treaty says um, to paraphrase what's in Article 14. 
Um, if the parties decide to extend the New START treaty, it shall be extended for no more than five years. Um, the other two points I make are, are contextual. Um, to me, that language reads, uh, the plain language reads is that there's no limitation on how many times the parties can extend the treaty so long as it, the, the total amount of extension is less than five years. Um, the contextual point I'll make is if the parties felt um, somewhat illogically that it was important to constrain themselves to only one extension one time um, during the negotiations, I've seen no record of that. And as I said, I don't think that would make a lot of sense. I think it's much more believable that the parties would want to maintain some flexibility on this particular point, given the um, political nature of negotiations, the ups and downs of the bilateral relationship, et cetera. Um, it would make more sense to me that the, the negotiators, um, one of whom is moderating this event, would want to maintain some flexibility on this point. Um, the second point um, I'd like to make is, you know, it, it, I find it very hard to believe um, that without specifically writing it into the text of the treaty, um, the parties would have um, more intention than is already there in the plain language on this type of provision. So um, as a general rule, um, the United States and Russia as parties to the treaty are the judges and juries of the treaty. They're also the, the barristers uh, who are um, arguing the case in front of the judge and the jury. And if they decide that what this provision means is they're allowed to extend the treaty multiple times, that is all that matters. Um, the, the text could be even more vague and more opaque in terms of the negotiator's intent, but as long as the United States and Russia across the table from each other agreed that this provision allows for multiple extensions, that's all that matters. I don't think that Russia has taken a formal position on whether multiple extensions are allowed or not, but to me that is the key point for the U.S. government to explore if uh, multiple extensions is uh, reasonable, you know, in the 2021 timeframe. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, we're uh, coming up on our last uh, seven minutes here. So I wanted to just let everybody know that we'll be uh, on our last round of questions now. So please try to keep your, your answers uh, short and so everybody can get their, their final, final remarks in. We've had a question uh, asked anonymously that less than half of our arms control efforts with Russia since 1972 have taken the form of a treaty as defined by US law and no doubt as Russian law as well. Uh, what are your thoughts now about uh, using executive agreements, uh, sometimes called politically binding agreements or <clears throat> in our case, presidential executive orders and similar mechanisms uh, in uh, the Russian Federation? In other words, non-treaty mechanisms for uh, future efforts to control and constrain uh, nuclear weapons. James, let's start with you. And bear in mind, it's your last, uh, your last go. So if you have other remarks you wanna get in there in a few minutes, please go ahead. No, I, 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 I'll just be very brief so we can try and get through as much as we can. Um, I think a new start follow-on really by, it's, it's massively preferable to have that as a legally binding treaty arrangement. Um, not least because, and you know, I can't, Alexei will correct me if I'm wrong here, but Russia has always argued that it can't permit inspections uh, without a legally binding arrangement that allows them. Uh, it can't, um, you know, I, I just think this is an issue that is Im important and high stakes enough that the predictability of a long-term legal arrangement really makes sense if you can at all get one in spite of the high barriers. There's lots of other issues that I think are also important issues that we can't handle via legally binding arrangements. I mean, issues like ballistic missile defense, non-strategic nuclear weapons, those are issues in the short term at least, which I find it very hard to conceive of a legally binding arrangement. Uh, whereas but I can see politically binding confidence Build, uh, confidence and security building measures that I think would make sense. And Pranay and I and our colleague TD McDonald are working on those. We'll be publishing that later in the year. So I'll just give that, I'll just end on that shameless plug. Thank you very much, James. Pranay, I think I know your views on this, but uh, please uh, take the floor and uh, any, as I said, any last remarks you'd like to make as well. Sure, thanks. Um, I mean, just very briefly, uh, you know, we have the Arms Control Disarmament Act. <clears throat> it would not allow the U.S. government um, to um, secure any agreement that would obligate the U.S. to reduce or limit its military forces 
um, unless it's through an Article II process as well. So that involves a treaty or some other form of legislative approval. Um, you know, for example, the SALT one interim agreement required a joint resolution by the House and Senate, simple majority in each. Um, so that's that's certainly something that could be looked at, but I see a couple of problems um, with an approach that does not use the standard Senate two-thirds advice and consent treaty process that we know well. Um, one, I think, in, and Alexei can speak more to this, uh, I'm assuming that Russia would like the next agreement um, on strategic offensive arms to be a treaty um, probably feels, and I think correctly so, that the U.S. takes treaties very seriously. Um, and I think the United States Senate may feel that it's within the U.S. Senate's purview um, to govern arms control agreements. And, um, you know, Vice President Biden has made comments on this when he was a senator in the early 2000s, um, when Jesse Helms was the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Um, and I believe other senators in the past have expressed similar views that agreements of this kind should be pursued through treaties. That being said, I think there's some flexibility in the U.S. system to allow, as James said, to pursue um, versions of this agreement but certainly more flexible versions of this agreement through a non-legally binding process. But I think for the legal protection awarded to inspectors um, to allow for the exchange of notifications of what would normally be classified information regarding the status of nuclear forces, those are the types of things that um, you need some kind of domestic legal framework to be uh, amended to allow for. Um, the, the only other quick point I wanted to make regarding um, Alexi's suggestion regarding uh, counting bomber weapons. I think, you know, as James mentioned, we we cogitated on this for months. Um, one of the things that uh, stuck in my mind through this is the parties going into New START felt that the way that bombers were based now, as opposed to how they were based in the Cold War, um, when they were on strip alert, when there were constant bomber patrols, when they were armed at all times with nuclear weapons, when they were fl um, flying up in the sky. Um, that's not the case anymore. Bombers are based very differently. There are no longer strip alerts. There's no longer constant deterrence patrols. So I felt that that was important context for determining whether we should count specific bomber weapons against numerical limits. And um, as you'll see in the report, we do talk about new conventional and uh, nuclear precision munitions like air launch ballistic missiles or air launch boost glide systems, because we believe that those are concerning and they should be limited. But the way in which we choose to limit them is to adopt some of the bomber counting practices of New START. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, and Alexei, uh, you'll get the chance now to, uh, to bring us home to wrap it all up. So the floor is yours. Well, I agree with most of what was said by James and Prene. I would only add to that that uh, um, all kinds of uh, surrogates for uh, hardcore arms control treaties uh, may be good when relations are good and trust, mutual trust is very high. But we are not in the situation now. And uh, uh, arms control, practical arms control is not about trust, it's about verification. If we had verification system going on, uh, a few years ago, we would be able to resolve the controversy over medium range missiles uh, much easier uh, because verification of the INF treaty provided for that, but it ended long before this crisis in INF treaty occurred and Russia was um, accused of uh, violation and there was no way to uh, seriously verify whether Russia was in violation or not. The same goes about American ballistic missile defense deployments in Romania and Poland. Russia accused the United States of violation of INF treaty, but there was no verification system because ABM treaty was uh, had been dead for, for a long time by that time. There was no way to verify what was in launchers in Poland and uh, Romania. So th that's a good example with respect to uh, politically binding and legally binding arrangements. We have a mixed experience uh, of that. Uh, parallel security initiatives in the beginning of the 90s uh, led to drastic reduction of tactical nuclear weapons uh, by Russia and the United States, in particular in Europe, but overall. An order of magnitude reduction of tacti tactical nuclear arms, although there was no verification uh, to check whether those politically binding uh, initiatives uh, were uh, 
um, abided by or not. But then relations were spoiled and we now have a lot of controversies about tactical nu nuclear weapons. How much was reduced? Who was living up to commitments? How many are left? It's now a serious issue. We, did, we didn't have time to address it, but it's a fascinating subject, which probably may address some other time. Uh, but uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, at the present state of relation, it is very hard to conclude a new formal practical arms control treaty, but it's exactly the state of bad relations which requires such a treaty. No politically binding unilateral commitments or executive agreements may, may be a substitute. Also, of course, expansion of START uh, probably does not require verification, maybe implemented through executive um, directives. Thank you very much, all three of you. This has really been an excellent discussion this morning. You've raised so many issues. I apologize to those who asked their questions and we couldn't get to them. There were a number of rather technical questions, excellent questions about uh, the nature of dual capable systems. James, I'm sure you could have knocked that one out of the park. And Ian Anthony asked about the future of, uh, of verification and what we need to do to now talk about the future of verification. I couldn't agree with, with that more. But uh, I'm afraid we are out of time. If you didn't get your question answered, please, I'm sure all three of our, uh, of our uh, participants today would be happy to get your question via email. And uh, in um, my case, I'm delighted to have had this honor today to uh, moderate this, this discussion. And uh, I also wanted to praise the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, honestly, for keeping their events to one hour, because I think it, uh, it does make for a lively conversation, although we do fail to get to every single issue. But anyway, thank you so much uh, to our audience today. Thank you to James, Prene, and Alexei. And thank you to Aaron McLaughlin, who is behind the scenes, and to the comms team at Carnegie for making this event possible. Come and see us again. We'll look forward to the next event of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and uh, its nonproliferation program. Thank you. Thank you.